Welcome to the Lost Distillery Company and uh, we're here at the home uh, of our brand home, uh, De Vries House and uh, we have a special Christmas uh, tasting. We're going to go through the whole range of the Lost Distilleries and who we are. So um, this is hashtag Lost Live. Please follow as uh, we continue the journey across the range. And uh, let's explore where we are here. Why is a lost distillery? In English, we say lost distillery because it closed forever. It is silent, never to open again. So we have here some old distilleries from the 19th century. We're going to take you further back in time. This is a time. Why did they become lost? The reason is because of various things like war prohibition. 100 years ago, there was no scotch being made in Scotland, uh, no pot distilling, it was banned, it was prohibited. So these are uh, interesting times for scotch that uh, this is um, uh, not uh, uh, the era for uh, expansion. This is consolidation, the distilleries are going to close. And uh, so we have uh, traumatic experiences. There's no grain getting into London 1917. So there's no um, pot distilling being produced, no scotch. So uh, this is a very traumatic time 100 years ago. And um, there's a prohibition in America 1920s to 1933. This is another reason why uh, some of the distilleries close. And also modernization from industrial age uh, is going to change and uh, the fortunes of Scotch. But uh, the consolidation in the industry creates the super brands that we know and love today. So um, these have an impact and some are swept aside because of progress. So uh, how do we do this? How is it possible for us to bring these back to life? There is no old warehouses of Scotch that uh, uh, sit in uh, uh, distilleries. We have, a um, 100 years ago, the liquid has been uh, uh, consumed over time, over two world wars as well. So it's not possible to always have a distillery and it's not always possible to reopen the distillery as well. So um, we are like the Indiana Jones of Scotch whiskey. Uh, we have to go on a quest to find these old recipes that uh, lie out there with the history books and uh, this is headed by Professor Michael Moss and uh, the team of archivists. There's a few things that we have to bear in mind first of all and this is uh, whether it was a good distillery, it made uh, good quality scotch, scotch and it also had a history that we could uh, uh, regain its legacy and protect its legacy as well. So this all factors were very important to the start of the process of how we archive, uh, spend three months going through the whole distillery's life. A bit like CSI Miami, uh, going into the DNA of Scotch uh, to look at the peat source, the barley, the yeast, maybe in the 1870s, the yeast before was not commercial, more wild yeasts. So that would have a factor in how the end product would be. So um, there's all these different elements, the era, a location, a region, all these factors that we look at uh, in the research of this. And um, once we do the site visits and we have what we feel is like a recipe, then we can send our whiskey making team in. We have um, Hedy by Scott Watson, our master blender, who uh, will then want to create a profile of each of these distilleries. And uh, we have seven in total now. The full set has been made with all the different regions. We have brought these to life um, through uh, sourcing the casks from 80% of Scotch whiskey distilleries today. So we uh, bring different styles of casks. Only single malt is a blended malt, not blended Scotch. Blended malt uh, is like the full orchestra of scotch playing and uh, the full chocolate box uh, awaits us with the different casks, each one with a different story. So these are uh, then bottled. Uh, this is a classic range at 10 to 12 year old single malts 
and uh, these are only single malts in the bottle and a marriage of five to 15 different single malts to create the profile. And uh, the iconic bottles, black, some people ask why. This is because uh, these homage to the style before we have clear glass. So this takes in a short journey of how the Lost Distillery Company creates these styles of whiskies. Uh, started from uh, 2013. However, like Colombo, one more thing is that uh, this is not a copy. This is how we feel they might produce the whiskey today if they were alive. It's very important in our philosophy of how we do this uh, because uh, this uh, uh, Scotch whiskey has moved on in 200 years. The trends have changed dramatically. We are all our palates so used to very mature uh, liquid, whether it's brandy, scotch cognac or bourbon. So uh, this is a philosophy of these distilleries to give them a legacy that they never had. So tonight we start with Ochnagi. In the centre of Scotland, Ochnagi, you might call Ochnagi if you're local, you might call Ochnagi, and if you're Doric in Aberdeenshire, you might say Achnagi. Now, Ochnagi Distillery uh, opened in 1812. 1812 is when Napoleon is marching to Moscow. But in Scotland, in the Highlands and the Persia Hills, is more quieter times making Scotch whisky. This thrived nearly 100 years to 1911, just before the First World War. Och Nagy was way up in um, uh, the Athol State near Balanuig, off the A9. And uh, this uh, whiskey distillery was a farm distillery. So they took the peat from Loch Broom high on the hills in Perthshire. And uh, they would have harvested local and they would have had to use horse and cart. Now, this is a time before the 1823 Act, when the distiller's licences come out, where there's explosion of the Scotch whisky industry. So this is a time of illicit times. But at Ochnagy, what's interesting is, this is small distilleries, small hamlets. Uh, when you drive through the A9 past Dunkeld, you see small hamlets. These would have all produced stills of whisky. And this would have been sourced by the blender down. So it would be smaller productions, maximum 30,000 gallons. Uh, nowadays, we're so used to individual distilleries with huge production figures. So this is a time before, a bit like um, uh, Bordeaux wine producers, they all uh, come together to create these blends. And this is through the era of the blending uh, in 1850s when Andrew Usher brings in the blending era. So Ochnagy Distillery... This is uh, James Duff that opens it, and uh, this is going to be a lighter style. It's Highland malt, but has uh, a more floral notes to it. I like to call it like the breakfast whiskey. Uh, yes, breakfast, not Brexit, breakfast whiskey. Uh, breakfast is citrus, cereal, and honey notes that come out in this higher stills that would have had in Ochnagy and High in the Persia Hills. So, this one is... Um, like aperitif style whiskey and uh, you can have uh, notes of floral and then on the finish is like boiled sweets you might say in the US hard candy hello if anyone's from the US in France maybe bonbon de julie hello en francais and uh, this is uh, aperitif style 43% uh, non-chill filter and a beautiful way to start the evening so Och Nagy Distillery sadly falls in 1911. Uh, the uh, water uh, powered production and uh, it was swept aside by one of the bigger companies uh, in history. And uh, so sadly that uh, it was horse and cart business that would have uh, befallen this distillery that um, would have uh, been the end of Och Nagy. So we wanted to bring this back to life because many people um, love these old stories of the, the distilleries and they were important pioneers in Scotch. Uh, this was bought in 1890 by Tommy Dewar's becoming a successful uh, guy with whiskey around the world. 
and was dropped so the other distillery was built because uh, it was so inaccessible high in the hill. But it made good whiskey, which is the most important thing. So from the Persia Hills, a Highland style, but masquerading more like a Lowland style. Then we move on to Strathedon. Strathedon is in the kingdom of Fife. Strathedon we take in the Strath and Eden, Strath Open Valley. If you drive towards St Andrews today, the, the Open Valley, the Strath, you can see the Lomond Hills in the side. Eden is the name of the river. And uh, this was in the centre of market town, Ochtermachti in Fife. Ochtermachti, that famous place where the proclaimers come from, but uh, also where oh, the uh, Strathedon distillery was. 1829, Alexander Bonthrone opens this distillery. He's 31 years old distiller, right through to it was 1890 that he uh, uh, distilled one of the oldest distillers that ever existed in Scotch whisky. Strathedon distillery, uh, was very unique. It was a pioneer of a single malt style Scotch uh, long before single malt styles existed. We know because the archives tell us very much about this style. Sorry? I just need to adjust this a wee bit. And uh, butts are found at the distillery. So uh, lots of information about how this was. It was water powered and it came through the centre of the town. You can drive through today and see through the uh, the stone that was carved uh, the tributary of the Eden River, the River Eden that opens out near St Andrews. So Strath Eden Distillery, very unique style. On the nose has a citrus, um, uh, orange and uh, dark chocolate notes, uh, the um, uh, sherry casks, the older fill, and then the complexity on the mouth, the tanginess comes through on these maritime notes uh, from this uh, Orkney style peat. So there's a kind of whiff of smoke, a small whiff of smoke. And um, this uh, strategy in 1926 fell because it didn't modernise in time in the generation. The, long the wrong piece in history for this distillery as uh, the 1920s came in with the US prohibition, big customer, Strathedon would fall for this. So uh, very sad, they made a very good Scotch whisky. And uh, Alexander Bonthrone, his three generations of his family, uh, were very instrumental in the, in the distilling, brewing and um, uh, milling industry from the 1600s, his family, uh, in the Kingdom of Fife. So uh, very instrumental, very uh, um, influential character. Uh, the ear of Herbert Asquith, who became the Prime Minister in the First World War. So uh, he was a very interesting character and bought illegal still from a lady miller. Alfred Barnard talks about, um, I'm not sure that she was a lady by the description that Alfred Barnard uh, gives, but she had an illicit stills and was distilling in the Lomond Hills. So lots of interesting stories. Then we move over uh, to the space side. So we're taking in the highlands, the lowlands, and then we're moving up to the space side. Here we have a change in colour and casks. Uh, we have this uh, Oloroso casks, the sherry casks are coming in, and this is Towie Moor, Speyside, six miles from Dufftown, we have uh, Towie Moor, Towie is a name of a burn, Moor being bigger, and uh, this is a fascinating story, 1897, there's Peter Dawson, who is like a um, whiskey entrepreneur, you might think of him as uh, Richard Branson of Scotch whiskey, fascinating character, uh, that um, Peter Dawson opens this distillery. He's got heritage. His grandfather, very influential distiller in the times in the early 1800s in Speyside. And uh, this Peter Dawson, the man with no legacy in Speyside, who uh, rests behind my shoulder. And uh, he was a very uh, incredible character in the Victorian era through the Edwardian era where uh, he uh, would bankroll the first flight from England to Australia, the first single engine flight. And uh, he was a real entrepreneur character. He created one of the biggest vattings in Scotch in 1890. And uh, he partly he owned Ochnaggy at one time, but he also opened one of the iconic Seven Stills Convo Moor distillery uh, in Dufftown. So Towie Moor just along the road. Uh, if we take in the history, 
before they're making scotch in the Speyside region in the Moray there's a belt a lime belt of stone this stone was being worked in the quarries by the families like the Grants that would go on later to become the world famous brands of scotch but uh, this was also near uh, the quarry uh, the River Towie and at one point in 1931 there was a water contamination where the quarry was being worked and the stone ended up coming through uh, the water into the whiskey creating a cloudiness, a fizz um, the taste of the whiskey was fine but the blenders lost confidence and Mr Dawson had to dump 2.9 million gallons of scotch onto the market and uh, the, what would help some of the biggest brands that we know today uh, give them a leg up was Mr Peter Dawson. His whiskey was on the ship of whiskey uh, galore uh, that was in 1941 during the war. It was found two different of his brands were on board. His whiskey found across the world. So despite his ill fortune, despite the fact that he opened the distillery in 1898, the year when uh, the Pattison brother crash in Glasgow, the blenders of nervousness, a bit like 2008 with the um, Lehman Brothers crash. This would um, be a terrible time in history to open a distillery, one of the worst times, but uh, he still made a name for himself. But he's sadly forgotten to history and we want to remember this incredible character. On the nose we have those uh, classic sherry notes, but uh, green apples, apple pie, pastry, a whiff of tobacco. Because back uh, before the Second World War, there'd be natural peat element through these Speyside whiskies and uh, peaches, some vanilla. Incredible dram, Slangeva to Peter Dawson. And then we move on to the story of Jericho. Jericho, you might call our Christmas. Uh, story whiskey with the name Jericho 1822 religious farmer William Smith he opens this distillery in Aberdeenshire n near Imsh in Aberdeenshire and uh, this his brother is a preacher uh, the river the stream is called Jordan and uh, he's uh, both very fond of the Bible so they call it Jericho but unfortunately now only the walls of Jericho, the ruins of Jericho exist. So this is very deep. This is uh, Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez casks. This is a story of pioneer of sherry cask matured scotch. Today we see the trends of craft beer and craft gin. In the late 1880s we have the trend of sherry cask matured scotch. In history, the Speysiders would take the glory, but there's the silence of Aberdeenshire's part in this. Because we know from the archives and our research that uh, the local people, not travel around the world, but the local people took this to their heart. And this is the story of uh, how the local Aberdeenshire people bought into sherry cast matured scotch. This would sadly fall in 1913. Uh, the last liquid of Jericho in 1939, two weeks before the Second World War, there's a wedding in the barn in the distillery. And the old style of distillery wedding, they would have had uh, a cask of whiskey. Not like today where you have Prosecco and craft beer. Um, this is uh, we have a cask of whiskey. Once the whiskey is drunk, the wedding is finished. So uh, this is um, beautiful complexity on the nose. We have dried fruits. We have leather notes, sweet spices on the palate. Jericho is what we call a Highland Sherry Bomb. If you like Sherry Bombs, this time of year, big fan of Sherry Bomb whiskies at Christmas time. Jericho is very much in that area and uh, debuted in the late 1880s at the World Fair in Edinburgh. It never travelled the world like some of the other distilleries we have here, but it was a home favourite and a pioneer of sherry cast matured scotch. So we raise the glass to Jericho. In 1884, the distillery changed its name to Benicky. So Benicky is the name that we uh, have this for in the US. So this is uh, called Benicky, named after the beautiful mountain in Aberdeenshire, which will be covered in snow at the moment. So um, 
This is uh, the Highland Sherry Bomb next to the Speyside, uh, just east of the Speyside. And then we're going to travel up to Gersten. Gersten was in Holkirk, uh, way up in Caithness. And you can see the colour, beautiful liquid, is lighter colour. But lighter isn't always uh, a lighter whisky. So we have some very interesting terroir to explore. Gersten, 1796. This is the same year that Napoleon is marrying Josephine. Just after the French Revolution, the um, American Civil War. And uh, the ships are coming over the top of Scotland with a uh, sherry port wine and also rum cask so there's a rum cask influence in here uh, the style of whiskey you would be drinking would depend on the landowner uh, uh, the wealth of the people would have an, an, uh, an effect not like today it's more even playing field but back in the day if um, you had more money better casks then you would have a probably a better uh, style of whiskey um, so Lord Thurzo would take uh, Gersten down to London um, 672 miles before we have the trains and uh, the uh, ships would be taken down before the motorways so uh, he he was friends with Sir Robert Peel who is set up the Metropolitan Police uh, in London and also um, the Duke of Wellington so very influential friends in the Houses of Parliament would have spread this across the known world to places Madra Madras, Calcutta even Buenos Aires in Argentina. So this was a 19th century superstar, Gersten. What makes this fascinating? The terroir up the top of Scotland, and I like to call it the three billion years in the glass. I give you three billion years, maybe in 60 seconds. Is it possible I can do this? Well, here we go. Let me try. We know Scotland starts life three billion years ago in the South Pole. We know this from geology. So it travels uh, three billion years ago up the west coast of South America, 410 million years ago. And then there's a very dramatic event about 400 million years ago. It's a series of islands, what we call America. It's like the opposite of Brexit, you might call it. It's uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland and one island, England and Wales and another, and they crash together to create the British Isles 400 million years ago. Why is that important? Because in geology, the top of Scotland, very different from the south. If you look at London and the White Cliffs of Dover, very different geology indeed. So uh, the top of Scotland, very salty, briny land. Take you back further in time, nearer in time, 10, 11,000 years ago, the Ice Age, the Age de Glace, uh, recedes off the top of Scotland and uh, revealed that for tens of thousands of years, the ice uh, seabed had been scraped onto the land, pushed down by the ice, and this salty, briny land that we have at the top of Scotland. So this creates a salty, it's almost like um, smoked sea salt uh, caramel notes. So toffee caramel on the nose from this uh, rum cask influence. And then we move to the saltiness on the palate. So Gersten has a beautiful complexity, lighter colour, not a lighter whiskey. And beautiful with a charcuterie with meats or berico ham. Fascinating dram is uh, Gersten, and that is very top of Scotland. Now, then we take you to Dalla Ruin, our very brand new one this year. It's taken over a year to bring this to life. Again, the colour of the casks are different, the chocolate box of scotch. All these different flavours and journeys to explore. Uh, we have the Dalla Ruin and uh, this is Campbelltown. We take you to Campbelltown. This completes the journey of the set that we have been archiving. We're very proud to bring this dram to life and the story of the whole of Campbelltown because we know today three distilleries um, that we have and uh, Springbank, Glen Scotia, Kilcairn uh, but before 34 distilleries in its heyday in its heyday the rise through the 1800s 
would see the rise uh, that had become one of the most expensive places to live in the UK in 1890. Now, um, this distillery opened 1825, closes in 1925, a hundred years or so. Uh, uh, Charles Colvo and uh, he calls it David Colvo and Co. a group together uh, to open this distillery. Famous name in the uh, Scotch Colvos. And uh, this is a time when the uh, birth of Campbelltown distilling starts. So you have this um, uh, very interesting uh, different styles of Campbelltowns. Uh, we know from our archives there's a lot more profile than what was existing today that had in the past. There's very mixed feelings about the styles of Campbelltown, but there were some distilleries making some very fine Scotch whisky, and this is why we researched Dalla Ruin for that very reason. They survived uh, so long, 100 years, because of the steamers, the paddle steam. This is the story of the paddle steamers. 1812, the first one goes down the Clyde. It's 1825, this opens, and uh, this uh, paddle steam time would be the ships that would take the cables across the Atlantic for the telephone. So this was a very um, iconic era and uh, the rise of Scotch. In Campbelltown, you would have been able to have sourced barley in different places if there was a bad harvest um, because of the transport links were so good. Glasgow and going across uh, to the US, but also uh, locally in Isla and down the coast, England and uh, Europe. So Campbelltown was in a prime position and uh, there were some dips in the way, but um, everyone had to close in the 1920s. Uh, calamity as the whiskey capital, the once whiskey capital, would fall to its knees. Very sad story. Many people hold Campbelltown drams to the heart, like myself. And um, this is a, a, a very fascinating dram to try. On the nose, dried fruits, maybe fresh figs. And then there's a kind of smoky bacon, like smoked ham uh, profile on this one. Lovely complexity, uh, has um, a long finish. And um, much pleasure is to be had with a Dalaroon. Some people dream of a white Christmas and other people dream of Dalaroon. Dalaroon's name is fascinating as well because it comes from the old name of Dalrada, the kingdom of Dalrada. Six to eight century, uh, you have this Celtic kingdom that crosses the two countries, Northern Ireland and Antrim, and Kintyre in Scotland, and they speak this uh, different tongue. This uh, Dalrada um, is uh, the kingdom, the Celtic monarchy, but also the sea, the geologists believe with the Stone of Destiny, famous stone that travelled down to Westminster, where that um, uh, journey started geologically, the stone coming from around Campbelltown. So some fascinating stories. Uh, Cross Hill Loch, the water supply, and um, this uh, had a very tumultuous history. Many of the, the founders died very early on in the story of Dalla Ruin, but uh, made a very fine Scotch whisky. Now, they all closed all the distilleries in Campbelltown, 1920s, and then, obviously, uh, Springbank, Glen Scotia reopens in the 1930s, uh, and then the Second World War comes along. So they had very difficult times, and uh, it's fantastic to have these drams today with such tragedies. In the 1920s, Campbelltown went through a very difficult time. People had to leave and travel to the new world to uh, try and make and scrape a living. So many people had to emigrate. And uh, when this distillery closed, the reason to Etra, why I he I'm here talking to you, is because can you believe within a decade, this distillery is closed, they auction all the whiskey off, demolish the building and then build a, a housing estate on top. They build a housing estate and then change the name. So all the legacy is gone, the heritage is gone. So this is why we are here because uh, for some reason we have, for the, for the, the, the name of progress, we uh, in Scotland have hidden over 
so much heritage and yet it's the absolute reason why people love Scotland and Scotch is the rich heritage and culture. So that's why we explore and bring you this today, Slangevar. Next, uh, we are taking you on the journey. Uh, this, we have to go to Isla. Uh, it's very important as part of our Scotch experience that we travel to Isla. Here we have Lossett. Many people have got lost in Lossett. Um, Lossett is a fascinating story. We celebrate 1817, 200 years ago this year, that this distillery on Isla opened. It became one of the island favourite distilleries, top three producer, 120,000 litres in the 1830s. So a bigger producer on the island, no one has heard of. Why is this? How did this happen? It closed in 1867. And although that's a long time ago now, it was one of the longest surviving 19th century distillers of the farm distillers on Isla. So this is a farm style distiller. If you think today of a farm style distiller like Cahoman, uh, Lossett would be in that same field. So what's fascinating is we bring something different to smoky whiskey here. On the nose, uh, we have pears, we have almonds, almond milk, lactic notes, and then there's a wall of smoke comes. But you'll find the wall of smoke is gentle. It's not aggressive, it's not bitter. It's something quite different in a smoky whiskey. This is 35 ppm. It's 10 to 12 year old single malts, so it's in the younger side of things, but fresh phenols. You still get the peat, the smokiness, but uh, you don't get this uh, fright that you get. You might get in some whiskies. So this is uh, a fascinating dram to try. Uh, wins Best Blended Malt 2017. And um, this is uh, the journey that we end on tonight is from Isla. So we've traveled from the lowlands and the highlands, um, Speyside, uh, Highland Sherry Bomb, to the top of Scotland, Gerston, and down to Campbelltown, and then to complete the whole journey, like uh, the set, the uh, box set of Game of Thrones, you might call it, the Lossett on Isla. And this is near Bally Grant on Isla. Um, this is a small uh, farm style, so it's like a house. Now today is uh, the estate manager's house, so it still exists. The land, the Dunlossett estate, uh, a beautiful part of Isla if you find yourself on the island. And uh, this is a fantastic uh, place to discover and go on the tours of the distilleries of Isla. Uh, and Lossett was part of that as a lost distillery. Sadly, um, it was built inland before the 1823 Act. Uh, illicit times and uh, so it was built inland near Bally Grant, Loch Lossett uh, beside there and um, you know they have the horse and cart business once the big distilleries are open next to the sea and the transportation is good then the writing is going to be in the wall for Lossett even if it was a favourite choice of the islanders at the time for its illicit style. So um, sadly that passed away, 1867, we raise a glass to Lossett uh, for its memory and uh, how a fantastic dram. This was one of the most challenging, if we talk honestly and openly about how we bring these to life. It's not always easy, it's very difficult decisions have to be made about interpretation and Lossett was one of those difficult decisions. But we are very proud, it's taken a long time to bring this to life. This has been the classic selection, and um, this is 10 to 12 year old. We have all these ones here, which is the archivist selection, and we also have the beginnings here of the vintage selection. Uh, so this is 15 to 18 year old single malts, 25 years and over. So this is an incredible chocolate box of scotch to discover. Tonight we only discover the first seven. Uh, the others are the older expressions of each of these other ones. So the full set has been completed. Um, I'd like to thank you all for following us tonight. Please follow and uh, hashtag Lost Live. 
love to hear your uh, feedback on how uh, you feel about the drams. If you've been tasting, please uh, take some photos and share with us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And uh, it's been a great pleasure to spend uh, time with you tonight from all right across the globe. Uh, we have people I know from Asia uh, at very late o'clock at night and very early o'clock um, on the other side of the US. So thank you very much. We say in Scottish, Slanjava, which means good health, but also we say haste you back, come back, hurry back quickly, uh, because we have more stories to tell. And if you'd like us to continue the stories, we have many stories to explore at the Lost Distillery Company. Thanks very much for your time this evening. I hope um, you have a fantastic uh, Christmas. Merry Christmas to everyone and a happy new year when it comes. Thank you very much and Slanjava. Lovely.